Hey, thanks for watching this sermon from New Life Church. We believe the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It is a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. We hope this message is a blessing to you today. Good morning. It's good to be with you. Good to worship with you, church. Uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Tarek Whitmore. I am the young adults pastor here at New Life Church. Thank you. And uh, myself and my wife, Anna, we have the joy and the, the privilege of serving our, our college students and our young professionals, those at New Life in their that sort of 18 to 20-something season of life. And we've been doing it for the past five years. It's such a blessing. We're really honored to be able to do that. I'm honored to be able to share the word with you this morning. Pastor Mike and Miss Bonnie, they're, they're resting up right now. They're they're recuperating. We're in a really busy season as a church. We're in transition. We're getting into this new building situation. God's really been moving in our midst, and um, our pastors need a break every once in a while. Amen? Yeah, so we love them. We bless them, and we're going to hold down the fort for them, right? All right. Well, before we get in the Word, I have a couple announcements for us. First is this. Uh, prayer room uh, is not going to meet over the summer. If I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure I understand this right. Um, I think the last prayer room, if we have a slide for it, we don't have a slide for it. <laughs> okay. Uh, did we already have the last one, or the last one is this Wednesday? Okay. You guys know better than I do. We've got one more prayer room uh, before we shut it down for the summer uh, while we're in this transition. It'll resume August 7th. So the last prayer room before summer is uh, next Wednesday, May 29th. It's from noon to 1 p.m. And then uh, we'll pick back up August 7th at our new location in Flower Bluff. Uh, next thing we have is child dedications. Sunday, June 9th, uh, we have child dedications at both the 9 and the 11 a.m. service. You can sign up online. Uh, the information's right here, newlifecorpus.com slash dedication. This is for anybody that uh, has a, a small child, or I mean, I guess you could bring your teenager to this, but it, any, any parents out there that you, you want to make the commitment to raise your children in the Lord, we have this sort of as a ceremony, a brief ceremony to commemorate that decision on your behalf. And so we have the families uh, come up on stage and uh, Pastor Mike and Miss Bonnie, they'll lay hands on them, they'll pray for them, they'll bless them, and then we as a church family have the opportunity to extend our blessing and just honor these parents' commitment to raise their child uh, in the things of the Lord. So important, uh, honestly, now more than ever, that we raise our kids in the things of God. I mean, the way that the world is, is looking. And so uh, it's a beautiful opportunity just to Again, just to declare it in front of your church family that we're going to raise our children for God. The last thing uh, is Greater Things Conference, July 24th through the 27th. I believe that's a Thursday through a Saturday. And uh, this weekend, we have a Memorial Day discount. So Greater Things is coming in. They're doing the conference. We're hosting it. We're providing the building, some facilities. Some of our staff are going to be helping out. But this is their conference, Randy Clark and Global Awakening. They're coming. They're, they're having their conference here. Um, and uh, this weekend only, so the official registration fee for the conference is $125 per person. This weekend only, they're doing a Memorial Day discount of $75 per person. And so if you want to take advantage of that, that's a great opportunity. I don't even know what the percentage of that is. Somebody else can do the math. But that's a good deal. Um, I, I've, I've never been to greater things, but I have been to uh, a Global Awakening conference in the past. And, uh, man, it's just such a, pr uh, such a powerful experience. Really, their ministry is the ministry of impartation. What that is is essentially taking what God's done in you, taking what God's given you. How many of you realize that the things that God's given you and equipped you with are actually transferable? Now, your history, your intimacy with God, the, the, the long hours and years of, of building that relationship with God, that's not transferable. Everybody has to have their own relationship and history with God. But the gifting of God, the anointing of God, it is transferable through the laying on of hands and Global Awakening specifically. They've had such a powerful ministry of impartation. Myself, you know, personally, the last, I, I went to a conference in October and 
I got in five minutes what it takes many to receive in years. Things that have, uh, or, 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 or I should say this way, I received in five minutes uh, more than, a, than I at times have received in a matter of months or years just through the laying on of hands. It's biblical. It's powerful. Uh, honestly, you just have to come and see for yourself. So take advantage of that discount if you, if you like. All right, you guys ready to get in the Word? All right, if you brought your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Peter 5.10. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. Now, uh, I told you that I lead the Young Adults Ministry with my wife, Anna Whitmore. Uh, she's sitting over there looking pretty. She doesn't like it when the attention's on her. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we have two uh, small children. We have an 18-year-old. 18-year-old. How's that? We're going to dedicate them uh, in a couple of weeks. No, we have an 18-month-old. His name is Judah, and uh, he's awesome. He loves birds, and he loves pointing at things, and his favorite toy is balloons. And he's, he's just a sweet boy. And then we have a little girl. Her name is Noelle. And she is how old? She is two months old. And obviously I'm still playing catch up with that one. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we're doing the whole two under two thing. And it's, it's intense. I'm not going to lie. But it's, it's a blessing. It's extremely rewarding. It's tons of fun. It's definitely an adventure. And, you know, those of us who... Uh, have small children, or if you if you're expecting children, if you're if or if you've had small children and they're grown up, we know that man when they're at that early stage, there's they're just a bundle of unfulfilled potential. You know, they're in the first few months of their life, first few years of their of their life, and as a parent, you just can't help but dream about the future. Who are they going to be? What are they going to do? What's their career? What kind of person are they going to be? Uh, you just start to dream. You just really start to get a You can't even really help it. You just start to get a vision for your child's future. And, you know, it's, it's, not, like, it's not like you want to force your dream for their life on them. You, no parent, I think, wants to do that. Sometimes we do it by accident. No one wants to do that. Uh, but... Every parent, at the very least, wants to give their child every opportunity possible to fulfill the dreams that they have for them. Amen? Is that fair to say? That even if they choose something else, you want to make sure that they're fully set up financially, spiritually, that they have the morals, that they have the, the character, the habits, that they have everything they need to, should they pursue those dreams, they can and they can be successful. That's what every parent wants. And, you know, the Bible refers to God as a father. And like any good father, he's the same way. He has dreams for his kids. He has dreams for us, for our lives. God has, maybe you never thought about that before, and maybe you never realized that before, but before you were born, God actually envisioned and imagined and dreamt up a pathway for your life, a plan for your life. The Bible says that uh, his thoughts for us outnumber the sand of the seashores. We live in Corpus. You've been on the beach. That's a lot. We all know that. And his thoughts for us, they outnumber the sand on the seashore. He's thinking about every little detail of our life. He's thought it through. He's tuned in. He's, he's, he's not distant. He's not disengaged. He doesn't have bigger fish to fry. He is fixated on you. Zachariah says he, we're the apple of his eye. He's God so he can do this for every single one of us all at the same time. He's, he's thought about it. The, the Bible also says in Psalms that all of our days were written in his book before we were born. Before you're even born, he has a dream for your life, and he's written it down. Now, earthly parents, we're flawed. Okay, so uh, the dreams that we dream for our kids aren't perfect. They're, they're full of good things, good intentions. But other stuff gets mixed in there, you know. Like sometimes, you know, our unfulfilled uh, desires, we kind of transfer that to our kids, want to live vicariously through them. It's like... 
I'll be honest, you know, ever since Judah was born, uh, he's had a basketball in his hand. I never made it past high school varsity. Okay, he's got a basketball in his hand, and he may never want to play basketball in his life, but I'm going to make sure that the NBA is at least an option. Okay? Is that right? I don't know. This isn't about me, okay? This is about God. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, thankfully, God's dreams for our lives are, is perfect. It was, it's without flaw. Romans 12 says God's plan for your life is good and pleasing and perfect. What does that mean? It means his plan for your life is good. It means that you can live with a clear conscience when you live in God's plan for your life. Your, your head can hit the pillow every night. You don't have to feel dirty. You don't have to feel ashamed. You don't have to question. You don't have to wonder. You have a clear conscience. The money can't buy that. It's good, pleasing, and perfect. It's pleasing in that God's plan for your life is deeply satisfying. We all have a desire for uh, meaning, to make our mark on the world, to live an adventurous life. God's plan for our lives satisfies that desire. It's deeply satisfying. And the last thing is it's good, pleasing, and perfect. That means when each of us are, stand, are, are lying on our deathbed, so to speak, and we're looking back on our lives, we have zero regrets. And not in the worldly way where you pretend to have zero regrets because... You're unwilling to admit your mistakes, but no, truly, when you live God's plan for your life, when you live God's dream for your life, at the, when it's all said and done, zero regrets. That's what the word says. And the Bible refers to God's dream for our lives as uh, the Bible calls it calling. The Bible uses this word calling. When I talk about God, he's got this dream for your life, uh, anytime the Bible, you see the word calling in the Bible, this is what he's referring to. And that word calling in the original language, it, it can also mean like invitation. Right, again, this is not something God wants to force on us. It's something he wants to give us every opportunity to experience. Every opportunity. We all have a calling on our life. We all have an invitation from God to live out his will for our lives. The highest calling th that we have from God is the call to receive salvation. Maybe you never thought about salvation as a calling. Maybe you thought about it as a free gift or as, as just God's forgiveness or his mercy, right? The, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah, amen. Thank you, God, that by my, because of my sin, I was born into it by my nature. I'm subject to God's wrath, but because he loves me, he loved us, he sent his only son so that whoever repents, believes in him, doesn't have to perish but have eternal life. It's a beautiful gift, but it's also a calling. God is calling the world to salvation. It's not like he's going, here's this option, take it or leave it, I don't really care. No, he's calling, he's beckoning, he's... He's inviting, he's pleading, he's beseeching. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest for your soul. Right? It's the greatest calling there is, the call to salvation. And he's given us every opportunity possible. He sent his only son. Jesus came in the form, though he was God, he took the form of man, the form of a baby. Can you imagine being infinite, knowing everything, being able to do anything, go anywhere, being limitless, and then being confined in the form of a baby? I can't, I can't even wrap my head around that. Then he lived a sinless life, and though he was sinless, he was hated. He was tortured, spat on, beaten, killed, not for anything wrong he had done. But God was laying the punishment for the sins of the world on him. Then even as he hung on the cross, he cried out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then he, he looked up to the heavens. He said, it is finished. He released his spirit and the debt was paid. The receipt was shown as he rose from the empty tomb. Glory to God. <laughs> Everything, every opportunity possible. I mean, the, the, we are without excuse to not answer to not experience, not receive the calling of the free gift of salvation. But beyond salvation, God has, again, we talked about it, he has a, a detailed plan for your life, ins and outs, every aspect, every dynamic. And 
in the process of living God's calling for our lives, it is inevitable that we are going to experience suffering. We are going to experience disappointments, betrayals, rejection as we try to pursue God's call for our life, as we accept his invitation into salvation, and then we accept his invitation to be transformed into the image of his son, as we accept his invitation to go out into all the world and make disciples of every nation, as we accept his invitation to be holy, as he is holy, as we live out his plan for our life, we're going to experience resistance. We're going to experience adversity, okay? I, I, I don't know if you know this, but like bodybuilders, the really, the really, really muscular guys, when they go into the gym, their goal, their literal goal is to tear their muscles. They, they, they go into the gym and they apply resistance to their muscles to the point where there's actually micro tears in the muscle. So they don't, they're not trying to injure themselves where they tear a muscle, but these micro tears form in the muscles. Actual damage occurs to the muscle through resistance. And then over the recovery process and eating and nutrition and all that, the muscle is built back stronger than it was before. So that as they pursue their fitness goals and they're trying to get to a certain strength, a certain physique, whatever, they have to experience this resistance that leads to damage but ultimately gets built back and results in them being stronger than they were before. It's, it's part, this is part of the equation for living out God's plan for our life. Romans 8, 17 through 18, it says, Together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. It's beautiful. It's all been made available to us. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. It's part of the process. It's part of us becoming who God created us to be. It's part of us walking out the dream that God had for our lives before we were even born. It's yes, we would be redeemed by the blood of his son, but it's also that we would be sanctified by his spirit, that we would be conformed into the image of his son by his spirit through beautiful times of worship like we just had, absolutely. Through time in the word of God, absolutely. Through time in God's presence where you feel him so close and you get a sense of his love for you and and just how big he is and beautiful he is and you're having this amazing aha moment of revelation of who God is, Yeah, absolutely, but also through suffering. That's why Romans 8, 28 says, God uses, or sorry, God works all things together. How many things? All things. Together for the the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So it's not that God delights in our suffering. It's not that God, like, he, he... is even the, the originator of our suffering, but God is so committed to getting us where he wants us to go that he will utilize even our suffering, even the betrayal, even the disappointment, even the setback. He'll utilize that for your good because you're called. You're called to his purposes. Now that's a nice thought, but in practice, like how do we embrace that? How do we embrace God's plan for our life, God's dreams for our life, God's calling? How do we say yes to that when we know suffering is involved? Because it's easy to do that when you're looking back and you're going, oh man, I see God's work and all, I see his hand and all of this. He was so involved here and there and yeah, I went through a dark time, but I came out on the other side and I'm better, I'm stronger, I'm wiser, I'm better. All the, you know, all this, the, the Marvin Sapp song, all that stuff, it's easy when you're looking back, you know, hindsight being 2020, to go, man, yeah, God used that for my good. But it's hard when you're in the midst of it. When a, someone who's close to you just betrayed you yesterday, <laughs> and you're trying to navigate all the emotions of that. Or you, you have a financial setback, and you, you don't know what happened. You planned, you saved, you did everything you were supposed to do, and still there was a setback. It's, it's hard to do it when you're in the midst of this resistance, when you're in the midst of adversity. And it's, I would say it's even harder when you're in the midst of peace 
and there's a storm in the distance, and God's telling you, hey, I need you to go through this storm, and you're like, I kind of like the peace. I kind of like the calm. It's nice here. And he's like, we, you're not going to get where I need you to go unless we go through this storm. It's hard to embrace that in our human thinking, in our humanity, but, but we have the word of God and the promises of God that build our faith so that we can embrace God's plan even the negative aspects, even the hardship. And when we're in the hardship, we can be encouraged and know that this is not the end of it. 1 Peter 5, 10. Here's what it says. May the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. He called us. May the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while after you've been through the test, after you've been through the trial, after you've been through the setback, after you've suffered a while, may he perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Another way of reading this, because this is kind of a prayer from Peter, but it's in the word of God, it's authoritative, so we can take it as a promise. Another way you can read it is, the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you suffered a while, will without a doubt, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. His word and his will, they're settled in heaven. Jesus said it is finished. This is true for me, this is true for you. So the takeaway for today really is this, is that everything God has called you to, no matter how hard, no matter how difficult, no matter what you'll have to go through in the process, everything he's called you to, he will sustain He's not expecting you in your human weakness and your limited understanding to have to navigate this stuff on your own, to have enough patience, to have enough stamina, to have enough positive thinking to be able to get through it. That's not what he expects of us. No, he said, listen, I've called you to a life that's beautiful and fulfilling and all these things I described before. I've called you to this, and it's going to include some hard seasons and some hard times. But just know, I'm not expecting you to endure that on your own strength. I'm not expecting you to rely on your own, <laughs> your own ability to be able to fulfill the calling that I have for you. This is good news, folks. It's it's. We can't lose. The only way we can lose is if we quit. <laughs> the only way we can lose is if we, is if we don't believe him. <laughs> we don't trust him. We don't put our life in his hands. We don't obey. That's the only way we can lose is if we reject him. But like uh, Romans 8 says, no height, nor depth, no angel or demon, not things present or things to come. Nothing can separate us from his love. And nothing can separate us from his promise. So that means if you're in the midst of hardship right now, God's working it for your good, and even on the back side of it, he has his own little recovery process that's going to leave you stronger than you were before. And this, this goes for everything that we've been called to do. We have multiple facets of our calling, right? We've got the family dynamic. We're called to be... Husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, sons, daughters. That's a calling from the Lord. He's called you to do that. He's called you to do it well, but he hasn't called you to do it in your own strength. And sometimes we try to despiritualize things that don't have to do with church or ministry. But we don't realize that our God created everything in the heavens and the earth. Nothing was made except by him which means he has a monopoly on this whole thing. <laughs> it's all his. It's, it's, it's all within the context and the confines of his will. He's got a will for you within the context of your family, within your career. You can't despiritualize your career if God made you and he made work and he made the stuff that your company makes. You can't despiritualize your career. And while it's very difficult to despiritualize ministry, and by ministry I don't mean uh, being uh, paid by a church or on staff at a church. I just mean any way you participate in the kingdom, whether you serve, whether you share your faith with people out, uh, just out in your life. Um, 
whether you, you give, any, any way you contribute to the kingdom of God is ministry. And while you can't really despiritualize ministry, you can sort of professionalize it and go, hold on, God, I, I got this. This is what you want me to do? Okay, I'll take care of it. And we, and we treat it like some sort of uh, a task that we're doing for God instead of an assignment that he wants to do with us as our father. Even your friendships, even your relationships, God has, God has a calling for you in your relationships. He's got a will for how we navigate our friendships. And he's promised to sustain that calling. Right? It's that old saying, God doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of cheesy, but I like it. This is a promise, you guys. Philippians 1, 6 says, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 through 24, it says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. That means like over and over, continually, uh, glory to glory, leveling up, greater and greater measure, so that your whole spirit, body, your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. And this is what it says. The one who calls you is faithful. He will do it. Not you. He will do it. Take comfort. Be encouraged by that. So I want to kind of break down this passage, this First Peter, where it says perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. What is this divine recovery process? Well, that word perfect, in the original language, it's the Greek word katartizo. Katartizo. And it essentially means, like, the literal meaning is to mend. To mend. Uh, you can picture, like, if you take your pants to the tailor and there's, like, a small hole in them. It's like, they're 99% good, but the tailor's got to mend that small hole. It's to bring to perfection. And this word is also used in Matthew 4.21 uh, to describe the, the sons of Zebedee, to describe James and John, who were fishermen, and it's describing where they were when they met Jesus, and it says that they were on the boat mending their nets. What that means is that uh, they had a long night of fishing, and they're, they're working, they're throwing out the nets hundreds of times, uh, they're catching some, they're, uh, they're having, you know, it's getting tugged on by the fish, it's getting caught on the boat from time to time as they're dragging it over the, you know, over the, uh, what's it called, the side of a boat? The bow, I guess, I think that's the front. Anyway, um, the nets, they're getting damaged through the process of fishing, they're getting damaged through the process of the work, and so at the end of the day, at the end of their shift, they have to sit down and they have to mend the nets. In the process of obeying God, in the process of serving God, in the process of choosing to obey God's word, even when it's hard, okay, we're going to get some tears. We're going to get some wear and tear. It's just naturally going to happen. It's not necessarily popular. It may be popular right now in America to say you're a Christian. It is not popular, and it's becoming increasingly less popular to live like a Christian. It is becoming less and less popular to do what the Bible says. It's because of uh, the spirit of the age. The Bible calls it the spirit of antichrist. It's anti-Jesus. More specifically, it's anti-Jesus as your Lord. It's anti the leadership of Jesus. It's the air we're breathing. It's the culture. It's the zeitgeist. It's the spirit of anti, it's anti the leadership of Jesus. That spirit is totally comfortable with you coming to church and claiming to be a Christian. What it will resist fiercely is when you decide to do what the Bible says. Especially when it costs you. Especially when it costs you. And so naturally, as we're in this world and not of it, when we're living for, we're going to experience wear and tear as we're going against the grain, going against the current, all that stuff. And we have to know, we have to understand that one, that suffering, those moments, they don't last forever. And two, at the end of them, Jesus has promised to come and mend us. 
He's promised to come and sew us back together, to, to sew the patches closed, that it's okay to take a couple of hits. We don't have to get in fear that if things are going south or if we're experiencing resistance, that we're doing something wrong. Obviously, if you're sinning, yeah, stop, repent. But if you're doing what you know the word says, if you're doing what you know God called you to do and you experience resistance, we've got to be okay with getting a couple of lumps and bruises. What UFC fighter gets into the ring and is like, yeah, I'm coming out of here clean. I expect to have no injuries. It's like, no. Both fighters go to the hospital at the end of the night, the winner and the loser. Because even though the victor, he, he takes his lumps. And we don't have to fear taking our lumps. We don't have to fear resistance because we know that when it's all said and done, we have a divine uh, seamstress. We have a divine physician that's going to sew us back together. This is to give us confidence to obey because I know that even if it hurts in the present, even if it causes some setbacks, I know when it's all said and done that I'm going to end up whole at the end of this because God, he's committed to restoring me of these little cuts and bruises that I collect trying to live for him. The next word is, it says established. That's the Greek word sterizo. It means steadfast. It's the same word that's used in Luke 9, 51 when it says, now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is talking about Jesus knowing that he was going to die, and he knew it was time for him to be crucified, and it said that he steadfastly set his face to go to the place where he knew they were going to kill him. He knew he was going to die, and he couldn't just be like, all right, I'm going to keep going, and I'm not really sure if I'm going to go through with this. We'll see how it goes. If you do the we'll see how it goes thing, you will always compromise when things get hard. You will always deviate from the plan. If your ability to discern God's will is just based on what feels right in the moment, you will always disobey. You will. You will always disobey. Even Jesus himself had to decide ahead of time that he was going to go. He set his face steadfastly. It means to be sure, to be determined, to be set, unmoved. And as he went to the cross, he had his closest friends try to distract him. Some of the people that were in his own circle tried to distract him, tried to detour him from going to the cross. But nothing was going to keep him from the cross. That same determination that was in Jesus, he has promised to impart to us. Hebrews 9.14 says, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he offered up his life. That through the power of the Spirit, not just him white knuckling it and going, I'm going to do this, it's going to be hard, it's going to suck, I'm going to do it anyway. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, he set his face on Jerusalem. Guys, when we go through hardship, it's so tempting to quit. It's so tempting to change the narrative about what we think God has for us. But if we allow him the Holy Spirit, he will give us a resolute determination that nothing can, de can detour. <laughs> nothing. We will be so uh, sure, so determined that we are going to continue to live for God that nothing will be able to throw us off. Nothing will be able to change our minds. Not by our strength, but by his grace. It's a holy determination to fulfill that calling, no matter what. The last word is settle, and I believe it says strengthen and settle. And that word settle is themaleo uh, in the original language. It means to lay a foundation. Lay a foundation. It's this idea that after we've suffered a little while, after we've taken some hits, after we've taken some damage, living for God, that he will come in and he will, he will not just fix the cosmetic injuries, but he'll fix us at the deepest and most fundamental level. He will make us secure and stable at the most fundamental level. He will stabilize us even in the most unstable circumstances. And we are in unstable circumstances as a country. 
We, are in, we have an unknown future. <laughs> we don't know if America is trending up or trending down. <laughs> we don't know what's happening in the Middle East or in the Far East. We, we don't know. I'm not trying to, like, get anybody into fear. I'm just saying we, we don't know times are uncertain, and we can't know, and we can't rely on our circumstances to determine whether or not we're going to keep it together. Because people in the world, they don't have the Holy Spirit. They're freaking out. And they need somewhere to look for stability. And if they can't look to the body of Christ, where can they look? So we've been called to live for God steadfast and then allow him to strengthen us internally so that we are so secure in our identity and who we are in God. We are so stable in our trust and our faith in him that it's going to work out. He's going to work it for my good no matter what. We're so stable that people can look at us and be so confused at why we have so much peace. And that'll draw them to the kingdom like a magnet. It'll draw them to the church like a magnet. That as times get more uncertain, the church gets more certain about the goodness of God. As times get more unstable, the church is more stable. As the world gets more unsafe, the church becomes more safe. Because it's not, it's, it's not people that are insecure about their identity or their future or, or their resources. or their, it's, not, it's not the church won't be full of people who are insecure and their insecurities cause them to lash out at one another because they're in survival mode trying to protect themselves. But it'll be people who know who their father is, know who they are, know that he's made everything available to them in Christ Jesus. They have nothing to fear. They don't have to protect their own reputation. They don't have to claw for honor or recognition or opportunities. They're completely secure, content in who God made them to be, his will in their life, and their identity in him as a son and daughter. And so they're free to just give. <laughs> They're free to serve. They're free to love. They're free to concern themselves for the needs of other people. That's the church that God's going to use to bring in uh, uh, an end times harvest of souls. That's the church that God's going to use in Corpus Christi to bring the hopeless and the hurting and the lost and the demonized and the oppressed and the addicted to himself because while their life is falling apart and they're falling apart, they see a people who know who they are. They know who their God is. And when we say we have the answer, there's something in our eyes that tells them that we mean it. <laughs> and we're telling the truth. Amen. Thanks for watching online. Don't forget to follow us on social media at New Life Corpus. And we love to see you on Sunday at either 9, 11, or 1 o'clock services.